invitation to speak in this uh, to speak in this wonderful seminar. Uh, so I will talk about some joint work with Hang Bui about negative moments of the Riemann zeta function. Um, so I want to, maybe not everyone here is doing analytic number theory, so I want to start by giving some introduction about the Riemann zeta function. Uh, so how do we define it? Well, when uh, the real part of S is bigger than one, then the Riemann zeta function is given by a Dirichlet series, one over the Dirichlet series of one over n to the S. And it also has an infinite uh, Euler product, so an infinite product over primes of one minus B to the minus S inverse. So when the real part of S is bigger than one, things are relatively easy and well understood. Uh, now it's more interesting what happens to the left of one. So it turns out that the Riemann zeta function has a meromorphic continuation to the whole complex plane, and it has a simple pole at S is equal to one. Uh, and it satisfies a functional equation, so we can relate zeta of S to zeta of one minus S. So because of the functional equation, it turns out that the most interesting um, place where we can, where we want to study the Riemann data function is the so-called critical strip. So in between the lines with real part of S0 uh, and real part of S1. A fundamental question about the Riemann zeta function is um, the question about the location of its zeros. It turns out that understanding zeros tells us a lot of information about, for example, distribution of primes. So we know that the Riemann zeta function has trivial, so-called trivial zeros at uh, negative, um, negative even integers. And the Riemann hypothesis uh, says that the non-trivial zeros of zeta should all lie on the line with real part of S equal to one half. Another big open question uh, is the Lindelof hypothesis, which is actually implied by the Riemann hypothesis. So the Lindelof hypothesis gives a strong upper bound on the size of the Riemann zeta function on the uh, critical line. So the critical line is the line with real part of s equal to one half. So the Lindelof hypothesis says that zeta of half plus i t is bounded by t to the epsilon for any small epsilon. So here you think of t as being large, it grows, and then zeta of half plus i t is never bigger than t to the epsilon. So the main, uh, the main focus of the talk will be moments of uh, the Riemann zeta function. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how moments were introduced. So they have a long history. They were introduced more than 100 years ago by Hardy and Littlewood. Uh, so the 2kth moment of zeta is defined by this ik of t. It's the integral from 0 to t of zeta of half plus it to the uh, 2k, absolute value. Um, the reason why Hardy and Little would introduce these moments is that they realized that um, the Lindelof hypothesis is equivalent to showing that the two case moment is bound, bounded by t to the uh, to, t to the one plus epsilon for any small epsilon for all um, integers, positive integers k. So one, um, the fact that um, the Lindelof hypothesis implies the upper bound is easy. The other way is true as well. Um, of course, uh, they weren't successful in showing that the uh, two case moment is bounded by t to the one plus uh, t to the one plus epsilon for all k. The Lindelof hypothesis is still open today, but this started off the um, the research into moments of zeta, and not only moments of zeta, but moments of uh, other L functions, so L functions and families. So. Uh, for a long time, moments were not really well understood, not even conjecturally, but this uh, changed with work of Keating and Snaith. Um, so they conjectured that if you look at the two case moments, then you have an asymptotic formula um, with the main term of size uh, t log t to the k squared. So this part was relatively well understood for a long time, and it follows by pretty simple considerations. But then the interesting question is, what is the constant in front of this main term of size t log t to the k squared? It turns out that you can essentially write it as a product of two other constants. So one constant a k and another constant g k. The a k is, again, it was pretty well understood be even before the work of Keating and Snaith. It's uh, given in terms of an infinite Euler product. So it's this uh, infinite product over primes, which converges. But the GK was uh, not really understood until the work of Keating and Snake. So before discussing what GK is, let me just explain the log T to the K squared part and the AK part. So heuristically, if you 
uh, write the Riemann zeta function in terms of a Dirichlet series, so zeta of half plus i t to the k, that's the uh, given by the Dirichlet series dk of n over um, square root of um, n uh, times n to the minus i t. So here dk of n uh, is the case divisor function. So this counts the number of ways in which we can write n as a product of uh, k integers. Um, so if we write, um, if we ignore all questions about convergence and we write the 2k uh, power of zeta half plus it in terms of uh, Dirichlet series, we get this double sum over integers m and n, dk of m, dk of n over square root of m n, and we're integrating this m over n to the it. So you can see if m is equal to n, for example, the integral is very simple, so we expect to get a main term. Now, if m and n are far apart, then we expect to get a lot of cancellation in the integral uh, of m over n to the it. So heuristically, we only keep the so-called diagonal terms, um, which correspond to m is equal to n. And then we get the sum of dk of n squared over n. Say we truncate somewhere, say we truncate at t, and then we get an asymptotic formula uh, with a main term of size log t to the k squared and this arithmetic constant ak. So this is, the, uh, this is where the ak comes from and where the log t to the k squared comes from. And in general, whenever you have a family of L functions, it's um, by using this kind of heuristic arguments, you can usually write down um, the power of log pretty easily and the, uh, the arithmetic constant as well. But more interesting is what happens with this constant gk. So um, gk was known in a few cases, in a few small cases. So uh, g1, the second moment of the Riemann zeta function was co uh, computed by Hardy and Littlewood in the same uh, 1916 paper. Uh, g2, uh, the, second mo the fourth moment was computed by Ingham. Nothing beyond that is known um, unconditionally. Uh, for G3, there was a conjecture of Conry and Gosch, and for G4, there was a conjecture of Conry and Gonek, uh, but nothing beyond G4 uh, was known, not even conjecturally. So then Keating and Snaith had the idea of modeling the Riemann zeta function using random matrix theory. So they, th they said that the Riemann zeta function should behave in some way, um, should behave in the same way as the characteristic polynomial of unitary matrices. So if you want to compute the two case moment of zeta, you should look at the two case moment of um, the characteristic polynomial in the unitary ensemble. You compute uh, that random matrix theory integral, and you end up with this constant gk. And they conjectured that the gk that you get from random matrix theory is the constant that goes uh, in the moment asymptotic formula for moments of the Riemann zeta function. Um, there is another way in which you can uh, write down this, you can arrive at the same conjecture. This is the hybrid model due to Gonek, Hughes, and Keating. So before we had to put in this constant AK in some sense by hand. So random matrix theory doesn't know about primes. So we had this correction, this AK factor, which was the arithmetic part and then the random matrix theory part. And then Gonek, Hughes and Keating had this idea of writing the Riemann zeta function as a product between a part uh, which involves primes. So they truncate uh, the Euler product at some point X and then they have a product over zeros. So we write the zeros as half plus gamma n, and we look at zeros which are very close uh, to the point t within one over log x. And then if we assume a certain independence conjecture, so if we assume that the two case moment is given by the two case moment of the product over the prime, primes times the two case moment of the product over the zeros, then you actually can write down this same uh, keating snaith conjecture, but now it, this has the advantage that you can write the AK and the GK at the same time. So you don't have to put in the AK by hand. Okay, now there is a more refined conjecture. This is work of Korn reformer, Keating, Rubinstein, and Snaith, and uh, the methods, the heuristic method they use is called the recipe. So they predict uh, that the two case moment is asymptotic to t times a polynomial in log t of degree k squared. And then you have some power saving error terms, say t to the one minus delta for some positive delta. 
uh, pk is this polynomial of degree k squared, and of course the leading coefficient of uh, pk, so the coefficient of log t to the k squared, agrees with this Keating Snaith random matrix theory conjecture. So this uh, this conjecture, the Cohn reformer Keating Rubinstein and Snaith one, is not based on random matrix theory at all, and it holds for integer k. And there is another more recent uh, approach of Conry and Keating. They use long Dirichlet polynomials and results on divisor correlations, and they get exactly the same uh, the same conjecture as the recipe gives you. So I mentioned before that uh, in terms of rigorous results, we can only compute the uh, second and the fourth moment rigorously. Uh, work of Hardy Lit Littlewood, work of Ingham. Uh, for the fourth moment, Heath Brown later improved the um, the fourth moment asymptotic. So Ingham recovered the leading order term, the Keating Snaith conjecture. Heath Brown recovered the entire polynomial um, of degree k squared, of degree four in this case. Uh, unconditionally, this is all that is known. Uh, for the sixth moment, Ing uh, uh, computed the sixth moment conditional on certain conjectures about ternary additive divisor sums. And more recently, for the for the eighth moment, Ing, Shen, and Wong used similar results about uh, so conjectures about quaternary additive divisor sums, and they recovered the eighth moment. Um, so. Although in terms of asymptotic formulas, only the uh, four, first four moments are known, um, we do have upper bounds and lower bounds, uh, good upper bounds and lower bounds. So under the Riemann hypothesis, there are lower bounds of the right order of magnitude for all positive k. Well, this is work of Ramachandra and Heath Brown. Uh, there are unconditional sharp lower bounds for k, which is greater than or equal to 1 due to Radziwill and Sandararajan. And recently, there are sharp upper bounds for k between 0 and 1, again, unconditional due to Heap and Sandararajan. So we have unconditional um, lower bounds for all positive k. Now, in terms of upper bounds under the Riemann hypothesis, there are some older results of Ramachandra and Heath Brown for k between 0 and 2. Uh, there are sharp upper bounds for k of the form 1 over n, where n is an integer due to his brown, for k of the form 1 plus 1 over n. Uh, and we have sharp, unconditional sharp upper bounds for k between 0 and 2 due to heap Radziwill and Sander Arjan. So what can be said about bigger k? So this, these results that I mentioned here about upper bounds mostly hold for small k or special values of k. Well, we have upper bounds of the right order of magnitude, uh, and this is conditional. So for all positive k, um, uh, there's work of Sondererajan, which shows that the 2 kth moment is bounded by t log t to the k squared plus epsilon. So he's all, he almost has sharp upper bound up to this plus epsilon here. And this was later improved by Harper, who under the Riemann hypothesis removed the epsilon. So for all positive k, you have a sharp upper bound of size t log t to the k squared. And these results will be important in what I will talk about next. Any questions before I move on? Okay, so the picture for positive moments is pretty well understood. We have asymptotic formulas in certain cases. We have good upper bounds and lower bounds, either unconditional or conditional. The more difficult question is what happens for negative moments of zeta? And these are well uh, are not as well understood. So there's a conjecture of Gonek which says the following. So here we're considering the negative 2 kth moments. Um, now, because we are looking at the negative moment, so we have the Riemann zeta function in the denominator, we have to be slightly away from the critical line so that we avoid the zeros on the critical line. So we introduce this small shift delta in the negative two case moment. So now we're looking at the integral of zeta of half plus delta plus i t to the minus two k, and we want to study this integral. So the question is, um, how does this behave um, with delta? So we should expect when delta is closer and closer to the critical line, we're closer and closer to the possible zeros of zeta on the critical line, so things become more complicated. So Gonick's conjecture uh, states the following, depending on how big the shift is. So if the shift is reasonably big, 
by reasonably big, I mean that the shift is bigger than one over log t. So this, uh, the families we're looking at zeta of half plus delta plus i t, we integrate up to, uh, to capital T. So we can think of this as being a family of size t. So if delta is bigger than one over log of the size of the family, one over log t, then Gonex conjecture says that the uh, negative two case moment should be asymptotic to one over delta to the k squared. And now if delta is smaller, so if delta is less than one over log t, so here we're really in the range when we're very, very, very close to the critical line, then uh, he conjectures that the negative two case moment should take different, uh, should have different asymptotic formulas depending on the size of k. So if k is small, then we expect the log t to the k squared. Um, if k is bigger than one half, then we have this, um, uh, this other asymptotic formula, so we have a bigger power of log t. If k is equal to one half, then he actually predicts that you get a certain uh, logarithmic correction. So you have a term here, log of one over delta log t. Okay, so for k is equal to one half, something special happens and you see this logarithmic correction. However, it turns out that uh, if you use random matrix theory again, um, then um, this partially contradicts Gonek's conjecture. So there is work of, um, so uh, there's a question if Gonek's conjecture is unconditional. Uh, I mean, this is a conjecture. So um, it's not, I think the way he uh, gets to the conjecture is by assuming the Riemann hypothesis, but everything is uh, heuristic. It's conjectural. Uh, there's, Alexandra, uh, what does dt mean in the second display? Um, in the second display? Uh, yeah. So you mean the integral or? The, the integral minus k delta t then dt. Uh, this part here? Part. No, lo lo lower. The next lower one. to the left. Lower to the left, yeah. Next one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's a typo. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's no need. To. Uh, also, uh, I would like to mention, uh, just sorry, when you mentioned the fourth uh, moment, uh, income and then his brown asymptotic with power saving, yeah. I think the record is power saving T to two third. Yeah, that's right. By Zaborotny. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if we are to use random matrix theory again um, to model the Riemann zeta function, so now we are looking at negative moments of characteristic polynomials in the unitary ensemble. This was work of Berry and Keating and later Forrester and Keating for other, um, other ensembles of random matrices, which model other families of L functions. Then um, these computations partially um, partially contradict Gonex conjecture in certain ranges. So for example, they suggest uh, extra transition regimes whenever k uh, hits um, an odd integer over two. So when k is equal to one half, their conjecture, the random matrix theory computations agree with this Gonex conjecture. So you see this logarithmic correction when k is equal to one half. However, what Berry and Keating do and Forrester and Keating later on is they suggest that when k is equal to three halves, k is equal to five halves and so on, you see extra correction factors. Um, so it turns out that this has to do with the phenomenon of clustering of zeros. So for, um, uh, for random matrices, uh, Berry and Keating re uh, realized that clusters of uh, eigenvalues actually start contributing when you're looking at uh, higher and higher moments. So if we want to write down um, the conjecture taking these random matrix theory uh, computations into account, this is what you would get. So here I wrote conjecture uh, conjectures in quotes because um, the Berry Keating and Forrester Keating papers are uh, really just random matrix theory computations. So they don't write down what you would expect for the Riemann zeta function. But if you are to translate their work into this number theoretic context, then this is the conjecture that you would get. So uh, when delta is uh, big enough, so delta is bigger than one over log t, then this agrees, the conjecture that you get from random matrix theory agrees, um, agrees with um, 
Gonex conjecture. So you get the one over delta to the k squared. And then you can also pretty easily write down the arithmetic constant a k. So this was this didn't appear in Gonex conjecture, but it's not hard to write it down. Now, when delta is less than one over log t, then um, the conjecture that you would get is the following. So here, j is an integer bigger, greater than or equal to one. So when k is equal to j minus one half, so you have an odd integer over two, then this is what you get. You have this logarithmic correction here. When j is equal to one, so k is equal to one half, this actually agrees with Gonex conjecture because this term delta log t to the minus j times j minus one is zero when j is one. Uh, is one, sorry, the power is zero. Uh, however, when k is between j minus one half and j plus one half, then you get a, a, a different formula. So this doesn't agree with Gonex conjecture when k is bigger than one half. Uh, again, the arithmetic factor a k is re relatively easy to write down. So here mu k is the case, um, uh, the, uh, the case coefficient of the uh, negative case power of zeta. Any questions about this? You can also use the, uh, the same heuristic ideas behind the recipe. So recall that the recipe, the Conry, Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein, and Snaith conjecture uh, was initially written down for positive k, uh, for integer positive k. If you use the same heuristic ideas for uh, negative integer k, then you actually get something which completely agrees with this random matrix theory prediction. Uh, but that conjecture wouldn't tell you about uh, wouldn't tell you anything about what happens at uh, odd integers over two. So it would miss these correction factors of log of um, one over delta log t. So what is known about these? Uh, uh, in the same paper where Gonek made these conjectures, he also got lower bounds. So these are conditional. Uh, on the Riemann hypothesis, that he got lower bounds consistent with the conjecture for all uh, positive k in this range when delta is big enough, so delta is bigger than one over log t. He also got um, lower bounds consistent with the conjecture when k is less than one half in this other range when delta, in this small range when delta is uh, close to the critical line. So again, recall that these are the ranges where random matrix theory agrees with Gonex conjecture. So these are the less controversial ranges. Uh, Gonex also studied discrete negative moments. So if you're looking, uh, if you're summing over uh, zeros of zeta uh, with height up to t, and you're looking at uh, zeta zeta prime evaluated at the zeros to the minus 2k, then under the Riemann hypothesis and the further assumption that all the zeros are simple, Gonek got uh, a sharp lower bound. So everything that is known so far is um, uh, concerns lower bounds and is conditional. So not, uh, nothing was known about upper bounds. So in, um, we're, uh, in recent work with Hang Bui, uh, we get upper bounds in certain, certain ranges. So uh, everything is conditional. So under the Riemann hypothesis, if delta, so if the shift is bigger than one over log t to the one over two k, then we uh, get a sharp lower bound. So I write it here as log t to the big O of one. Uh, the big O of one can be made completely explicit and it's actually, we can make it to be log t to the k squared. So in fact, we can get um, sharp bounds here, log t to the k squared, maybe k squared plus epsilon, almost sharp bounds. Okay, so recall that we are expecting uh, in this range, we are expecting to get the log t to the k squared. Now, if delta is smaller than one over log t to the one over two k, we also need, uh, we have this condition that log of one over delta is uh, at most log log t. So this means that delta can be, um, must be at least one over log t to some constant. Okay, so we can't have, for example, delta to be one over exponential of t or something like that. Then we get this bound here. So the uh, negative two case moment is bounded by t to the k times this ratio log of one over delta over log log t minus one half. So you can think of the log of one over delta over log log t, let's think of it as a constant. 
So for example, if delta is say one over log t, then this is one. So what does this bound tell us? Well, the trivial bound. So if you're using uh, just a pointwise bound for one over zeta, then the trivial bound is um, uh, just t to the k times log of one over delta over log log t. So this part here is the trivial bound. So in this range, when delta is small, we're saving a power of t to the one half over the trivial bound. So of course, we are far from uh, getting sharp bounds in these ranges, but it's still a non-trivial bound. Any questions? And in fact, once you have, um, once you have, um, uh, sharp or almost sharp upper bounds, then you can actually get an asymptotic formula for the negative two kth moment. So here I wrote a corollary. Um, let's assume that delta is bigger than log log t over log t. Then we can actually get an asymptotic formula for the negative two kth moment. So we have a main term here, the arithmetic factor a k and the and zeta of one plus two delta to the k squared. So um, for delta small, this is uh, of size one over delta to the k squared. So it's what the connex conjecture predicts, what, um, uh, what random matrix theory uh, would predict in these ranges. Uh, but for these kinds of ranges, so when delta is bigger than log log t over log t, we need k to be less than one half in order to get an asymptotic formula. Okay, so when delta is roughly one over log t, you need it to be slightly bigger than one over log t, then we get asymptotic formulas for small k's. And in fact, we can write it down, so here I wrote down the error term as little o of one, but we can write it down explicitly. It's a t to the one minus two delta times some power of log t. Um, and similar results can be obtained for negative moments, for example, for quadratical functions over function fields. This is some prior work of mine. So this is a different family of L functions. Um, it's a discrete family, so it's not continuous family like the Riemann zeta function. Any questions? Okay, so before talking about the some of the ideas in the proof, I want to talk about some applications and some generalizations of negative of studying negative moments. So one both application and generalization is the ratios conjecture. So uh, this um, a precursor to the ratios conjecture for zeta was a conjecture of Palmer from 1993. Uh, so now, um, instead of looking at negative moments or positive moments, you're looking at ratios. So you're looking at ratios of zeta. So you have two zeta functions in the numerator, two zeta functions in the denominator. You're integrating uh, on the critical line. So S here is one half plus IT. And you have some small shifts, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Uh, Farmer originally conjectured that you can take them to be of size one over log t. Uh, let's assume that the real parts of these shifts are positive. Then if you're looking at the ratio of these uh, zeta functions over zeta functions, then he predicted a certain arithmetic formula, uh, arithmetic, uh, a certain uh, asymptotic formula. So why is this interesting? Well, it turns out that this conjecture actually implies many interesting results about zeros of zeta. So for example, it implies the pair correlation conjecture of Montgomery, a very strong result. So this essentially says that the pair correlation of zeros of zeta is the same as the pair correlation of um, eigenvalues of uh, matrices from the Gaussian unitary ensemble. Um, so, Noticing that there is this uh, connection between ratios and zeros of zeta, um, studying ratios became something that people were interested in. So it turns out that if you ad adapt this uh, method, this, the recipe of Conry, Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein, and Snaith, you can actually write down a conjecture for ratios as well. This was a conjecture of Conry, Farmer, and Zernbauer. So this is a more refined conjecture than Farmer's. Um, so it predicts some lower order terms and it's more specific. So it includes these arithmetic factors too. 
So uh, you have this function A of alpha, beta, gamma, delta, which is given in terms of a product o uh, over primes. You have, again, you're, you're looking at the same quantity. So two zeta functions over two zeta functions. You have these shifts, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And the conjecture was originally stated for the real parts of the shifts in the denominator. So we're looking here. So the real parts bigger than one over log t. So if you recall from Gonek's conjecture, one over log t was, uh, when you're uh, to the right of one over log t, it's the range which is in general better understood. Okay, so they predicted uh, this asymptotic formula for the real parts of the shift in the denominator bigger than one over log t. You have certain restrictions on the real parts in terms of the upper bounds for the real parts. These are there just to ensure that the uh, arithmetic factor A of alpha, beta, gamma, delta converges. So they are pretty mild. But the important part is that um, you have the lower bound of one over log t. And in fact, they say that you can probably take the real parts to be less than one over log t. So let's say one over log t squared, as long as the shifts in the numerator go to zero uh, at the same rate. So they should also be of size roughly one over log t squared. So what are some applications of the ratios conjecture? I should mention if you know something about negative moments, then usually you can also say something about the ratios conjecture, at least some partial results. But now what, uh, what are some applications of the ratios conjecture? So a recent very nice application, which at the beginning uh, at first sight seems not to have anything to do with Riemann zeta function or L functions, uh, is the proof that uh, almost all integers without local obstructions can be written as the sum of three cubes. So this is recent work of Victor Wang and it's conditional on things like the ratios conjecture or negative moments uh, of L functions. Uh, there are also applications to, for example, computing lower order terms for the pair correlation um, of zeros of zeta. So these were obtained uh, previously heuristically by Bogomolny and Keating using hardy littlewood type arguments, um, but the computations were pretty involved. And it turns out that using the ratios conjecture, you can um, write down these terms in a much easier way. And you can do many other things. For example, you can compute mollified moments of uh, the Riemann zeta function or of other L functions. Um, and this can have applications to certain non-vanishing questions. So one application that I like very much is to the question of non-vanishing for um, L functions associated to Dirichlet characters. So there is a conjecture of Chawla, which says that if you're looking at L one half chi, so here chi is a Dirichlet, any Dirichlet character, then the conjecture says that L one half chi is never equal to zero. So this is a strong conjecture. Um, if you focus on special families of characters, so let's say that you focus on the easiest family of quadratic characters, then Sandararajan showed that more than 87.5% of these L values are non-vanishing. And then uh, conditional on the generalized Riemann hypothesis, Osluk and Snyder showed that more than roughly 94% of these L values are non-vanishing. And they did that by computing the so-called one level density of zeros. So I, I'm not going to say exactly what this is. So the one level density of zeros is just a way of looking at low lying zeros in that family of L functions. It turns out that this gives you information about non-vanishing at the critical point. Now, if you assume the ratios conjecture, then you can actually compute the one level density of zeros for test function whose Fourier transforms have any support. And this would imply that 100% of these L values are non-vanishing. So this would give you the strongest result towards Chawla's conjecture that we would have available so far. Um, and before talking about some of the ideas in the proof, I also wanted to mention that if you're looking at the ratios conjecture in random matrix theory, so um, here we're looking at uh, ratios of characteristic polynomials um, of certain uh, matrices in certain ensembles, then most of the times um, you can actually write down exact formulas. So this is work of many people. I mentioned a few here, Conry Farmer Zernbauer, Borodin Strahov, Conry Forrester Snaith, many others. So I just wrote down an example of such a theorem. It's for the uh, unitary symplectic group. Here, uh, this, uh, this is the characteristic polynomial. 
and you can write it down an exact formula. So the situation uh, in random matrix theory is very different from uh, what, uh, what we have in number theory, where in most cases we don't know what's happening. So not even conditional on all the conjectures that you want. Okay, so now I want to describe some of the ideas in the proof. I hope it won't be uh, too technical. So we're looking at the um, negative 2 kth moment. Some of the ideas are similar to um, the work of uh, Sander Arjan and Harper on getting upper bounds or sh almost sharp upper bounds for positive moments of zeta. But of course we have some extra problems coming from the possible zeros which are close to the critical line. So we start with an inequality for log of one over zeta. So if you think of, uh, uh, if you think of uh, the Euler product for one over zeta, uh, you take the log of that, you can essentially bound log of one over zeta by the sum over primes of say you truncate somewhere at size x, you have these coefficients a of p, you can just think of them as roughly one. Okay, so you bound the log of one over zeta by one over p to the one half plus delta plus i t, and you truncate somewhere at some point x. And the point is the very important point is that you have flexibility in how you choose your x. And then you have a second term here coming from the zeros, a log t over log x times log of one over one minus x to the minus delta. So you can see that this term is going to be very big and it's going to cause a lot of problems if delta is small. Okay, so if delta is small, then this term is going to be very big. So now if we're taking the uh, 2k power of uh, one over zeta, then we get this inequality here. So we have this huge term here, one over one minus x to the minus delta to this 2k over log t over log x. And then you have an exponential of the sum over the prime. Okay, so what, in order to understand the negative two case moment, we have to understand the exponential of the sum over the primes, and we have to be uh, careful in how we choose our truncation, our uh, point where we stop the dx. So now what do we do? Well, this idea goes back to uh, work of Sandararajan for uh, upper bounds for positive moments. So we divide our primes into several intervals. And the point is that primes on different intervals behave differently. So you expect that small primes behave differently from bigger primes. Okay, so we divide our primes into intervals, say p is between t to the beta j minus one and t to the beta j. Again, this is a sequence which we have to choose carefully. It's not really, uh, I'm just going to say that beta one is of size log log t over log t. And then we, uh, at, each, at each iteration, we mod the beta j is like r times beta j minus one. And when do we stop? Well, we stop when beta capital K is a small constant. So in some sense, this x, the, the end point is a very small constant, okay? So uh, let's assume now that we are in this range when delta is bigger than one over log t to the one over two k. So this is the easier range when uh, the shift is big enough. So for each point t, we have um, three different possibilities. Okay, so we start with the small primes. So p1, this is the contribution from small primes. It's the contribution from primes less than t to the beta one. Uh, of one over p to the one half plus delta plus i t. So in general, we don't expect the small primes to have a huge contribution. So we're looking at those points t for which um, the small primes have a big contribution. So we have to decide what exactly it means to be big. Here I wrote that big means that the contribution from small primes is bigger than beta one to the minus d. So um, with my choice of beta one, this is roughly log t over log log t uh, to the one minus epsilon. Okay, so if the contribution from small primes is bigger than this uh, quantity, which is maybe not that important for the purpose of this talk, then we have to show that this doesn't happen too often. So this is what we're going to use. We're exploiting the fact that if the contribution from small primes is big, then we actually gain because it doesn't happen. It happens on a, on a set of measure zero. 
Okay, so um, we have the, uh, the integral over the exceptional set is not. Um, so it's usually hard to bound integrals over these very special sets. So we want to bound it by an integral over the whole interval zero to t. So we bound this by the integral from zero to t of zeta. And then we have this quantity here, beta one to the d times the contribution from the small primes raised to some power s naught. And we have flexibility in how we choose the s naught. Uh, and we want to choose it in a suitable way so that we um, actually get that this contribution is small. Okay, so now we have this quantity, beta one to the ds naught, and this goes to zero. So this is um, the important part. And then we separate the contribution from the primes with the moment of zeta. So we bound this by the fourth moment using Cauchy-Schwarz, and then the moment of the sum over the primes. So for, uh, for the first inter integral, so now we want to bound each of these integrals. For the first integral, we can use, we don't really have upper bounds for negative moments. So uh, there are no results in the literature. So we don't know what to do except for use a very bad pointwise bound for the negative of the zeta function. So for the first integral here, um, we use just the pointwise bound one over zeta is bounded by this quantity. And this is going to be, it's going to be a very weak bound because we use this strong pointwise bound for each value of zeta. But nevertheless, we're going to win over this trivial bound because we have this quantity here, which goes to zero. And then we have to compute moments of the sum over the primes, but we can do that. So this is a fairly classical thing to do. Uh, computing moments of um, sums over the primes, we can do that as long as um, the sum over the primes is not too big. So uh, this is a sum over primes. We can write it as a Dirichlet series, a sum over n of certain coefficients. Let's call them a n over n to the half plus i t. And here n must be less than t to the two s naught beta naught. So the point is that as long as uh, two as not beta naught is not too big compared to t, then we can actually compute these moments. Okay, so we will end up, if we put things together, we will end up with uh, getting that this contribution from the exceptional set is little o of t, so it's very small. It's negligible. Okay, now we move on. So now if we have a point t for which the contribution from small primes is well behaved, then we're looking at what happens with primes on the second interval. So now we're saying, well, if the contribution from primes on the second intervals uh, on the second intervals is not well behaved, so it's bigger than expected, then we also want to exploit the fact that this doesn't happen too often. If the contribution from primes on the second interval is uh, well behaved, then we move on to the third interval and so on. So at each step, uh, say step J, we're assuming that the contribution from all the primes up to the jth interval is small enough. So here we have these parameters, uh, uh, the beta j's that I defined before. So now we're assuming that the contribution from the primes up to the jth interval, each of these contributions is small, but the contribution on the j plus one interval is big. So it's bigger than this beta j plus one to the minus d. Okay, so let's call this set tj. Then what do we do? Well, recall, remember that we were bounding one over zeta by an exponential of a sum over the primes. Okay, so we had the exponential of the sum over the primes, say p up to x of one over p to the one half plus delta plus i t. Okay, so essentially we want to use the fact that we can uh, approximate the exponential by a truncated Taylor series whenever the sum over the primes is small. Okay, so we have this uh, nice inequality here. If say t is less than L over E squared, then we can essentially bound the exponential of t by the truncated Taylor series of the exponential. We call it EL of t. So this is the truncated Taylor series at the point L here. Okay, so this is exactly what we're going to use since the contribution from primes on the say H interval with H less than J, since this is small, then we can, we can essentially approximate the exponential of, um, 
of uh, the sum over the primes on the H interval, we have approximated by this truncated Taylor series. So we truncate the Taylor series at beta H to the minus D. Okay. So now when we take the integral on the TJ interval, um, we use our key lemma, so our inequality for one over zeta with X, the point where we truncate being T to the beta J. So then we have this exponential here, the exponential of the sum over the primes. And now the primes go up to this T to the beta J. So what do we do? Well, as we did for the exceptional set, we don't really want to have the interval over this special set Tj. We have to have an in, we want to have an integral over this whole interval zero to t. So um, we bound this by the integral from zero to t. For primes um, up to the jth interval, we uh, bound the exponential by these uh, truncated Taylor series. And then we multiply by this quantity, beta j plus one to the d times the contribution from the j plus one interval to some power is j plus one, which we can choose, we have to choose uh, appropriately. And the point is that this quantity here is always bigger than one, okay? So we bound this by this integral. And now this might look a bit uh, ugly, but it's actually, we can rewrite this whole thing inside the interval as a Dirichlet series. So uh, the first part here, this is a Dirichlet series uh, of a given length. It has length sum of beta h to the one minus d with h less than j, less than or equal to j. Now, if we look at the, primes on the j plus one interval raised to the sj plus one. Again, we can write this as a Dirichlet series. So it's a Dirichlet series of uh, size t to the s times sj plus one times beta j plus one. So the point is whenever when we unwrap this big Dirichlet series, as long as we choose our parameters wisely, this is going to be a short Dirichlet series. So we can actually compute the integral from zero to t when this Dirichlet series is not too long. Okay, so we can actually show that this contribution is also going to be small. Ah, so the point is that we have this quantity here, beta j plus one to the d, which goes to zero, which helps us. Okay, so this contribution is also going to be small. And then we, are, we get to the final interval where all the contribution on the, of the primes on all the intervals up to k, all those contributions are small. So let's call this set dk, then we just apply our key lemma. So we choose the, tr the point where we truncate to be t to the beta k. So again, we estimate the exponential of the sum over the primes by uh, this truncated Taylor series. And if we choose our parameters well, this is not going to be a long Dirichlet series, so we can actually compute moments. Okay, and we end up with this uh, bound of log t to the k squared plus epsilon. So recall that we expect to get the log t to the k squared. Um, and once we have this bound, this, um, this upper bound, then we can actually get uh, an asymptotic formula in these ranges. So this is something that happens many times with moments. If you want to get an asymptotic formula, many times you need an a priori upper bound, a sharp upper bound. Uh, in order to get some kind of asymptotic formula. So this is what we do later on. We use this upper bound to get an asymptotic formula. So everything that I've said here applies for uh, big shifts. So when the uh, shift is bigger than one over log t to the one over two k, if the shift is smaller, then um, it, the problem is a bit harder because as I said, the smaller the shift is, the closer we are to the critical line. So we do the same thing as we did before, but we have to do some kind of inductive argument. So um, let's denote by u this quantity log of one over delta over log log t. Again, let's think of this as a constant. So if delta is say one over log t squared, uh, this, is, this is two, okay? Then the point is that we do this, um, argument that I just presented, and we get some kind of bound here. So recall that the KU, T to the KU is the trivial bound. So now we save a little bit over the trivial bound, but then we can do this argument again. So 
recall that whenever we were bounding the contribution from the exceptional set, we were using some a priori bound on the negative uh, four key moment. So we keep doing that and at each step we use the a priori bound that we obtained in the previous step of the induction. So at the second step, for example, we end up with, uh, so this is the previous bound that we had in the first step. And now we save a little bit more over it and we keep going. And at the end, we end up with this uh, upper bound of size KU times one uh, minus one over two KU. Um, okay, so I think I will uh, stop here. Thank you very much. And I see that there was some question in the chat as well. So I can probably answer later after that.